Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 112. Nike versus Adidas. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. Today, myself and European DJ are going to discuss Nike, a European sports powerhouse, and Adidas, who are their European equivalent. All that and more. See you on the inside. Yo, 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 European DJ. How are you? Uh, I'm full of energy, EMF. Weekend is starting. Uh, I'll still uh, have some football today, so I'm really, really happy. And also, you know, um, I don't know if you know, but I have this buy me a coffee thing, right, online, where yep. uh, as a creator, people want to support me because they reached out to me. I said, okay, you know, one way is doing that, like, okay, buy me a coffee. So that's such an app. But my goal there is to reach 5 in the euro so that I get to buy a ticket to Watford, to Ireland, to meet you over there. And I'm now at 35%. So uh, I'm, wow. I'm, you know, whether Get you like it or not, uh, you're you're going to meet me at a certain uh, moment uh, when it goes at this tempo. So, you know, uh, maybe then also for the listeners, if you would like me to meet Derek face to face in Ireland, in the rain, recording a live podcast, Go to buymeacoffee.com uh, slash edgi and you can buy me there a coffee and help me on the road to meet this guy here, this bloke that I'm now talking to for two years. And then uh, watch at, him in the eyes. At, at this rate, you'll be you'll be over here right in time for winter season. So yeah, which is rain, right? Yeah, which is rain. Which yeah. you you you'll love it here. You love it here. I mean, I, I I can't wait. That'll be that'll be exciting. And to do a live podcast would be would be actually really really fun. Um, so get your PD joy over here. But you haven't bought me a coffee yet. Maybe you should uh, share in the ticket price, uh, my friend. <laughs> gladly. <laughs> I gladly will. I'll buy you two, two coffees. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, but I feel good. Good. How about yourself? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I don't have the, the, the weekend feels you have. I'm, I'm, I'm working tonight again. So I am, I'm a little bit subdued, but I'm, I'm actually looking forward to this, this podcast. Um, I know this was a request last week from one of the listeners. It was a question, and we said, why not just turn it into a show? So I'm looking forward to seeing the differences or probably similarities between both Nike and, and I call them Adidas. I know some people call them Adidas. Or <laughs> quite oh, but before we get there, right, I mean, have you seen the news about the inflation in the Eurozone, which came at 9.1%, and this is an average yeah this is an average at the same time they are predicting um several cold or expensive winters coming up yeah with the gas so i mean how how, how are you dealing with this at the moment like they're saying 9.1 percent it actually seems like it's so much more everything everything over in, in ireland certainly has has gone through the roof we haven't seen as much with the energy bills yet but i do have heard some cases with companies businesses and it tends to hit them first and there is talks of increases now coming coming our way so it's i think it's going to be a long winter i mean certainly going shopping and, and all that is, is costing a lot more i went out for lunch i treated i treated my wife and two kids just before they went back to school for lunch uh, usually it might cost you 40 45 euro it cost me close to 100 so wow. i mean it's 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 gone it's gone crazy um i don't know how I mean, I, I I'll be fine. I have, I have a high savings rate, but I'm, I feel really, really sorry for those on say minimum wage that are struggling yeah. to get by as it is, and and how they're going to manage this winter is is beyond me. And I know that our government is talking about increasing certain things, but on one hand they're <laughs> they're increasing what you give you, but then on the other hand they're increasing taxes, and then they're increasing yeah. prices and 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 so on. So they're they're giving but taking away at the same time. Um, but it's I, mean, well, I no, just checked, uh, uh, Derek, yeah. and Ireland is nine point one. It certainly feels a lot higher than than nine yeah. percent. Well, I can tell you what Poland is sixteen point one, the highest in twenty five years. Wow, over <laughs> here, 
What's the highest in Europe? Poland must be up there. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the highest is in Europe, but I mean, 16.1. Effectively, I, I got like a pay cut of 16.1% compared to last last year, all, all else being equal, right? So, yeah, I need to work harder, really harder still to, to make up on this, to, to, to stay flat with my savings rate. Or I'll just go back to ramen noodles. No. <laughs> we take it on the chin. We take it on the chin. But, you know, if this rate, right, if this is really the rate after a year, I also need to adjust a little bit my retirement numbers because I was averaging with a 3% growth or 4%, 4%, I remember at a certain moment. And, you know, you can do this for two, three years, but this is just cutting in straight away four years right yeah. and then i really need to adjust the numbers there and at the same time stock prices are getting lower so um it is it is uh it's a uh, yeah it's a bit, it's a bit, a of, a bit of a, a double whammy but uh, see the hard the hard part about now and uh, is that we have inflation and there's risk of recession and losing jobs and now we have a stock market that's crashing and we do know that we we both have asked for a stock market yeah. to crash but the problem is that people that invest weekly, monthly, or maybe even mm -hmm. every two or three months might not have that extra cash on the table now to invest exactly. when, the stock, when the stock market's going down. So you're kind of yeah. caught either way, which which is yeah. I, I still I'm still in the discount phase because I've got some money behind, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, it's true. If you just have less money left in the month, then you don't really benefit actually for what you've been waiting. But on the other end, dollar cost averaging, right? We, we just need to continue doing this. At a certain moment, we'll be in our favor again. Yeah. I can't imagine in Europe um, having 10% over a sustained long time because then we are really in other... Then we have, have, need to really have a different conversation as society because yeah. then we're really deep in shit. Uh, exactly. Exactly. We're, we're talking about depressions and, and way back, what was it, 1929 when we last yeah. saw something like this. But it's um yeah look it's it's crazy times it's going to uh, i genuinely think it's going to be a long winter for for some um, so let's see how our overlords and our governments handle this situation over the next six months yeah i, I will i will buy some of those uh, christmas sweaters that are really really thick within the uh, uh, what well, is the mousse on it or something like that because they are <laughs> nice warm and i will just use those keep, during the winter keep you warm exactly um, but we we had some bad news actually with one of our favorite companies, Shell. I was a bit surprised when when I read this, but the CEO is planning on retiring next year. It, yeah, that is at least what uh, Reuters is saying, right? This is not coming from the official press mm. uh, from Shell. But yeah, I mean, I checked, I looked him up. He's sixty four now. He probably wants to retire at sixty five, as as every normal citizen. He just yeah. gets like hundred million on the bank account with it um yeah i mean it's such a pity right of course he is in the history books of uh of shell the first person after since the second world war to cut the dividend so uh, i don't get don't think he gets a bronze uh, statue outside of the office but on the other hand i've always respected it that he made um, this tough choice because you know the oil crisis in 2016 was tough and they bought british gas group as well which was a really good deal specifically in hindsight when you yeah. when you look at it now it was actually an excellent deal still but they were just really really struggling getting out of that and then 2020 the COVID crash was just the uh, kind of knocking them uh, over and he did well really well by having the guts at the time uh, it reset the share price but it also allowed them now to have way more flexibility they're acquiring they're really transitioning now into new energy so I think he's been doing all all the right uh, stuff, and as, and still I've benefited a lot from the compounding effect, reinvesting the dividends. So I, I think he has always had a good view on capital allocation, and and this is what I really liked. And for me, he's really a captain of industry, without a blind spot towards climate change, but more a realistic view on this. And yeah, if he's really going to retire, we really miss him, and we don't know what what kind of yeah CEO we get back for it, right? Because they had Peter Foser before, I think he came. He was a CFO in the past, and it was nothing. Yeah, he was like, like, yeah, looking at it from a pure CFO point of view, and not from a business development point of view. What I do like is that this Lexman, no, sorry, this um, uh, Will Sawan is the he current head of Integrated Gas and Renewables. So that's he's kind of shortlisted. So uh, not knowing this person at all. 
I mean, the business unit that he's leading is the future. So if, if he's the one that also was really successful in that, then probably he deserves a chance, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the only worry is that we, we know we know there's a transition phase going on here, kind of led by, by Ben at the moment. And does the new CEO buy into that? Does he want to progress yeah. with that? Do they change from that? Um, there's so there's so many variables that can happen with a change um, of CEO that we, we have to wait and see. And as an investor, uncertainty is the one thing that we, we we're probably used yeah. to, but, but we we don't particularly like. So it's, I don't know a whole lot about the new guy coming in. He's obviously within the company, so he's well known. Mm -hmm. He's probably well liked um, if he's shortlisted for this. But it'll be it'll be a transition in terms of what the company are doing, but also in personnel, yeah. which which could be tricky to navigate as well. Yeah, maybe we should one of the once the successor is known quickly get him at the dividend talk podcast to tell him a little bit about what he should do with the dividend. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> keep increasing the body. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and the next news then, right? If you want to shift a little bit, is also around um, you know our captains of industry because Starbucks is um, uh, has announced, I believe, from April onwards next year or March that they will take the uh, I said the CEO from. I, I was I always wreck it, uh, Benzinger, right? So yeah. the the, yeah. the producer of Durex uh, here. Yeah, so. they, they have Durex and and some cleaner yeah. products. So he's he, he's not he has no experience in in running coffee shops, but he has experience in, in other areas. It seems everything safety and protection related. <laughs> I think the bartenders there uh, will, will be good. Will be good there. Yeah. And uh, maybe there's also some so, some cross selling possible there, right? Uh, let's say after nine o'clock on a Saturday evening. <laughs> who, who knows, right? <laughs> who knows? Yeah, and his name is Lexman. It, it sounds also quite like Latex Man, but okay, let's let's stop in <laughs> let's stop in this one. <laughs> but uh, I, I, honestly, I don't know anything about the guy really. But I did look him up this morning when I saw the news on our Facebook group. So maybe also for listeners, a small plug if you wanna. If you want to also communicate with us, uh, specifically myself, I'm quite active on our Facebook Facebook group, Divinity Talk. I'll put the link in the description of this uh, podcast. But there, the news was being posted, and I, I I looked him up on Glassdoor. And for instance, interesting fact that the CEO from from Racket has an 81% approval ratio by their employees, and Howard Schultz only 62 or 64, which is really not a high score. So from that point of view, um, this 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 new incoming CEO did something well there because it's not easy on Glassdoor to get high approval ratings, and we co of course we know that he will have to challenge uh, the challenge of the uh, the unions in front of him. Yeah. I think this might also lead maybe to a lower approval rating. But for me, these kinds of things like on Glassdoor are always really important, at least to see like what the employee experience is and the culture they have uh, brought in. If you look at a company point of view, Rexit. Rack racket, you know, it's not really exciting, right? It is it is dividend payer, it's 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 it's, it's a typical slow compounder, but it was not like that. I felt like, wow, you know, what has this company been performing over the last 10 years now? Yeah, I mean, he's he's done a good job at, at Rickett, and they, I think they capitalized on, on COVID. They have a lot of health and hygiene products, which mm -hmm. when, when COVID hit, they, they were really kind of waiting in the wings there and, and they capitalized really well. Yeah. So uh, for me, it seems like a bigger step up. It's like a, he's going yeah, to a, yeah, a lot, promotion. A, uh, do you mean he's going to a larger company there. We'll have a, a lot more eyes on and particularly at a company like like Starbucks. Um uh, with no interest in uh, no real experience in that area as well. It's all going to be quite new. It's going to be a bit challenging for him. But I mean he did a steady job at it so he seems to be well placed to to do a good job here too. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Um, the good thing is that um, uh, was it? how it should stays close connected to this uh, person. I think he doesn't didn't trust his last pick too much, Kevin Johnson. Yeah. He, he, he knocked him out. So uh, kicked him out. So yeah, that's good to for him Howard to stay around because you can see the difference when he's in. It's really like he really understands where the value is and. Yeah. And he doesn't look at short-term buybacks and such. Cool. Um, so we'll talk about Adidas and Nike. So we might start a little bit with Nike. They're probably the largest sportswear company. I think they're the top two in the world, actually, if you're to, yeah. to break them down. But I think Nike is the biggest. Um, but, but they weren't, right? They weren't in the past because Nike exists now 
for actually just 50 years. Uh, so they started in the 70s. And I don't know if you read the book uh, Shoe Dog uh, by uh, the founder of Nike. Yes, I'm about halfway through it, but I, I have it there yeah. on the shelf. So then you remember that uh, this guy just started, like I think after college or something like that, just importing some shoes from Japan. Yeah, yeah, and then selling them from from the, from his truck. He he had to, if I remember, he, he went over to make a deal, came back. They made a deal with someone else. He had to go back over and remake the deal. And exactly, came back and started sh selling out of his house and truck. Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty inspiring stuff actually. How how it started. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, one of their first motto was, um, like, not uh, just do it, but it was beat Adidas. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's also really the nice connection to the show today, that for Nike, Adidas was always the big guy to beat. Until I think this company really went into the stratosphere with uh, signing uh, Michael Jordan at the time, right? Yeah. And then we had the Nike Air Max, which was really popularized in uh, also in Europe, right? And, and that really put the brand on the map. And then we probably both know this a little bit from the 90s, uh, growing up, uh, early 2000s, right? The impact of Nike as well and Nike Air Max. So, I mean, it has a really, really iconic brand, I would say. Everyone knows the swoosh, right? The, 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 I mean, it, it's engraved in our brains, I think. And, and you can see this as well, right? What is so, what I think the company has been growing really, really rapidly over the last decade. And they're now having 46 billion in revenue. They also started to do direct to consumer. Yeah, so uh, just cutting out the middleman, and I believe Foot Locker has a big issue with this because I believe Nike uh, uh, mentioned like, "Hey, we're not going to sell everything via Foot Locker anymore." So the, the, I mean, they're really taking medicine to their own hand. Really innovative. You, could, they were one of the first ones where you could buy your own design shoes effectively or your own tailored shoes, and that requires really, really a strong manufacturing process, right? To 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 do all of this. And, you know, it's it's like even uh, they entered into sports like football, where it was always Adidas in the past, right? Yeah. Copa, Copa Mundial, yeah? And, yeah. And, and but now you see the kids all with Nike. So it's just a stellar company, and they keep on innovating. And I think also the last de decade, they've been really entering emerging markets, popularizing, popularizing their, the brand as well, the deals they make with the stars. So for me, Nike is like, also one of my tier one companies that I would like to have in my portfolio, but I don't own them yet. So, you know, if, if, if I did the analysis right, I, I, it's one of the safest dividends we can imagine uh, based on the dashboard that we maintain. It is a 97% dividend safety, wow. five-year free cash flow growth of around 25%, EPS growth 12%. So cash flow has been growing a bit quicker, but the AA credit rating, debt to equity 60%, with the interest coverage of 26 so they can really easily um uh, pay pay the interest on their debt low payout ratio in the in the low 30s mid 30s and a five year dividend growth rate of 13.8% and 20 years of dividend growth so the, the issue here just is the yield yeah they have a really low yield of 1.13% at the yep. current share price so but it, it, you know, people call it a growth company, but it's also a dividend growth company, and it has always shown lots of commitment to the dividend, and that makes this company so interesting for me. Strong brand, like I just mentioned, and you know, if we look at the fair value, right? Uh, our fair value calculation is approximately seventy six dollars, and it's trading now around one hundred seven dollars, um, and that is the normal case where we take like the four and a half billion of uh, free cash flow, but still a 15% growth rate, which is quite aggressive, specifically if we are expecting, for instance, an, uh, a bear market coming up or an economic slowdown, right? Uh, Nikes are not the ones, uh, how you say, no, Nikes are easily to cut on, specifically for lower and middle class income people. They can also go with the cheaper alternatives in those moments of times, right? Where you just postpone yeah. it. So it is a discretionary item. So, you know, even 76 is kind of already pushing it from a growth point of view. It's um, it, it's funny when you talk about the beginnings of Nike because Adidas is quite similar. Um, I think it was it was started by Adi Dazzler, I think I think was his name, but it was started in Bavaria in Germany from his mother's kitchen. So it's it's quite a similar story. And again, it didn't quite kick off until, if you remember, 1954 um, in the World Cup. 
the Germans ah, were yeah. playing. They were playing. Was it Hungary? I think at the time, Hungary were unbelievable and <laughs> mm. around this time. And it's it's called the miracle in Bern because they they actually won and they attributed some of the success. Well, they marketed some of the success mm. to the to the new football boots they had, and that really kicked kicked Adidas yeah. off. So the parallels between Adidas and Nike are quite quite strong there because Nike were the exact same. They started humble beginnings and then yeah. a global superstar comes in, Michael Jordan, and, and blows it up. So they're, yeah. they're, they're really quite quite similar in, in that in that fashion. Um in terms of I mean of clothing and I mean they're in this exact same markets and, and they're competing against each other. Anyone that's into sport, you play football, I play football. We all definitely had Adidas boots, footballs, as you said, Nike and we're in Liverpool now it's, it's it's all sponsored by by Nike. So the two of them are the main two players in football, in, in most sports, uh, athletics, everything yeah. that, that they're in. Uh, so they're competing in the exact same markets. I just think at the moment, Nike has a little bit of an edge because it has more superstars yeah. on, on the books. Uh, Michael Jordan being one. Um, I know they're selling like PSG have have a brand, a Michael mm. Jordan brand, which, which helps you would imagine with Adidas being a European brand, you would rather see someone like Paris Saint-Germain yeah. with, with Adidas. I, I personally, I mean, I wear Adidas. I mean, Adidas mainly. I like I like him over a little bit better than Nike, not because the European just they, they fit me better, but as a as a as a company. So you talk about some of the financials. Nike is definitely a better dividend payer. Uh, I was looking at Adidas. They had a they were going really really well. They were they were doing. Uh, really strong dividend growth raises and then boom COVID comes and they said nope we cut the dividend and then they came yeah. came straight back and it was lower than than what they had paid in 2019 so that's i mean from a dividend safety point of view that's that's a no-no for me especially yeah. when we're coming into this environment as you said they're a discretionary item if i want to go buy puma or if i want to go buy who else is out there a cheaper alternative I certainly will in, in terms of recessions. And another big thing that I only learned today is that they lost their trademark in 2019. There was some Belgium, uh, it's a Belgium sports brand actually went to the European court uh, to contest this three logo stripe being trademarked. And the European courts actually agreed with them and said, it's not enough. Um, it's not enough to say that this is attributable, attributable to to Adidas, so they've actually lost that trademark. I remember growing up, there was all sorts of trainers going around with four stripes, five stripes, but now they can actually probably use three stripes and not have to call it Adidas. So it's yeah, that, that's quite a big thing because a lot of people would maybe want to have Adidas but don't want to pay the money for Adidas. And if they see three stripes, they might buy the, the cheaper brand. Yeah, exactly. Think about what you can all buy on a Turkish bazaar when you're on vacation, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so using using their da dashboard anyway, I had their dividend as questionable. It still scores fifty nine, um, but obviously the dividend cut hurts it really well. Um, their average free cash flow growth is actually pretty strong at seven percent. Uh, earnings per share is a little bit lower, three point eight. Credit rating is an A two. That's on Moody's. Um, and their debt to equity is is quite low at, at 0.4. Uh, I do like their interest interest coverage, which is nearly nine, which is far more than I need. And both their cash flow, uh, free cash flow payout ratio, earnings payout ratios are under 60 percent. So I'm more than happy happy with that. As I said, my my main concern with them from a dividend point of view is that we know they will cut. They didn't start paying dividends until I think it was. The first I could go back was 2010. Um, that was the first one to see, and then they they caught it at the first sign of trouble. Since then, I would only assume that they would have caught it back in 2008 if if they had a choice. So, um, I would count them out as a dividend company. I mean, they're they're, they're a really really good company. I mean, the revenue is growing quite significantly. Um, just get the numbers up here, but the revenue back in 2012 was 14 billion. It's now upwards of 21 billion and probably hit 22 or 23 billion this year uh, so it's quite significant growth uh, all their oh, pretty much all their boxes check for me apart from the price the valuation the valuation i have them at about 113 euro they're trading at 148 i would actually expect them to come down to about 100 
over the next year if we start to see this inflationary pressure really sustain. Um, but other than that, everything else checks my box. The yield is currently 2.2. If they were to come down to my fair value, you're probably looking at around three, which would be acceptable. Um, but of course, it's that dividend cut that really sticks out in my mind. Yeah, and and Adidas is just, in my opinion, not a dividend grower. No, it has more this like uh, policy of probably you know paying out thirty to forty percent of their profits, which is a really conservative approach, right? When you're a CEO and you still give shareholder return, but we are looking at from a retirement point of view, not from a total return point of view, and that's where the mismatch is, uh, I think, with our investing uh, philosophy. And, and yeah, they didn't need to cut it probably even during the pandemic. Um, I know that people were scared, but look, um, Nike was probably also scared about what's going to happen, but they didn't cut the dividend. And maybe there's also something for the European companies should do more. They should, another reason to go to quarterly dividends, because then, you, then it doesn't hurt you straight away. Uh, if, if something happens like a pandemic in March, April, yeah then you know it's some cash and you can think like okay let's see how it goes in, in in july or in august and by july august they would have known like oh we'll manage yeah uh here people people are still buying shoes so yeah it's it's, it's a real shame because I, I like adidas philosophy and i know all about sustainability they're huge into innovation they work with lots of athletes and sports people and i think they developed a pair of trainers in the last olympics that was based on athletes data do you know what I mean so they really get involved in in the sports and really develop um they are they were this i think they have new trainers coming out for men and women now different designs and as far as i know they are more sustainable as well so everything they do from a philosophy point of view seems to be really really strong they have good innovation obviously the digital transformation is coming up as well we have lots of people buying online uh, people going to the gym health conscious we've spoke about this in, in other areas but that yeah. translate into these guys because lots of people go to the gym they like people don't walk around in jeans or chinos anymore it's more tracksuits and and t-shirts and, and adidas yeah. and nike are probably the two biggest that that you would see so there's so much potential for them if only that they had a more reliable dividend no i, I mean I, I i could have understood it if they maybe caught it a small bit uh, but they actually cut it completely and then reinstated it about 15 20 percent lower than what it was and that's yeah and, and yeah exactly because for instance tula I'm, I'm forgiving them because they still put the cash then in the next year after right yeah. so then you at least see like okay they have they have actually reserved the cash and still paid it to us that we deserved right but this is just this is just like an ugly dividend cut those ugly ones that we don't like but hey you know so for me it's clear um adidas wouldn't fit in my portfolio even at a proper valuation for this reason it's just like a no-go um yeah nike if it comes down i could have it i add for nike i could even make an exception to take it at a 2.2 percent yield usually i say 2.75 but nike is such a company if it would have a low payout ratio of 35 um, uh, percent i could take it at a 2.2 or something like that but it still means that the price should go in half from here and i don't see that happening anytime soon uh, really not so I, I wonder if it ever gets into my portfolio in the upcoming five years it's just too far in the sky for me i'm i'm i wouldn't be so sure like i'm I, at the moment it's it's still overpriced the market is is obviously a bounce it seems to be coming back down the overall market is dropping so i expect to see this drop as well but if we do start to see inflation I mean, we we talked off air that if if the inflation records in in Europe sustain for a year or two years, we have to recalculate our our goals and and how that affects us. But companies like this will will struggle. They're discretionary companies. I think patience will will be a key with this one. Just sticking around. Maybe I, I know you're you're a fan of putting in orders way below the the, the target price and and then forgetting about them and then it, then it hit. But I, I do honestly think this this could easily come down to about eighty. 80 dollars and at that price then i think i think the reward may may be bigger than the risks but i think patience is going to be key with, with nike i won't be in a rush to, to buy them now um but i i certainly would like to own them but at a much better price yeah so let's see good let's go to some listeners questions uh emf and the first one is from our Facebook uh, uh, group members, and it's Kasper. Kasper is asking, 
what do, do you think that next week's economic events will have a big impact on stock prices or is it already priced in he's asking this because he just got his salary and he and and uh, the greedy parts of him uh wants to wait to buy at lower prices <laughs> i mean that's crystal ball territory <laughs> it's, it's it's such a hard question it, i mean i i didn't know that there were there were economic events next week i mean yeah. i guess they are every day usually if they are and if there's a big event it's usually priced in in advance obviously if there's shock news at the time of an event there's an immediate reaction but uh, there's always there's always sentiment in the lead up to it is it bearish or bullish i don't know what news this is either by the way but if it's bearish the market usually trickles down beforehand it might be an overreaction the news might not be as bad and then we get a little pop and then in the reverse if it's if if the sentiment is a little bit bullish and then we get not so good news and it, it drops a little bit so it's it's hard to know um my advice is if it was me if i was going to wait to buy at lower prices the market would definitely definitely go up the way it always goes opposite <laughs> of what i want so i i just can't wait anymore <laughs> yeah and i mean i mean the stock market today is already a candy store after the drops we have seen uh, this week so i mean yeah yeah, I, I fully uh, fully with you what you say. Hey, the, the next question I'll, I'll give to you. It's too hard to answer for me, this one. Um, Anders Storgaard is asking, during the current dip in the market, a lot of great companies are at attractive prices once again. I struggle with the concept of averaging down into a position, especially when I only buy one position a month due to fees. How would you do it? In a downtrending market where you have lots of great buys but only one shot in the barrel each month I, I, there you go i, I can't answer this one and, and, and the math just doesn't work i i tell you anders right i had the same problem so i was uh, only i woke up this morning and i was there okay I'm, I'm working this weekend i'm off on sunday so i'm gonna spend sunday i have monday off and tuesday off and wednesday so i'm gonna send sunday monday tuesday going through what i want to buy but in my head, I was thinking, because usually I buy one company a month, but there's just so many companies I might want to buy now. It's just I don't know. I don't know how to actually do this. So it's it's really it's really a hard hard question. But focusing on top quality companies first. So I will be looking at my Microsofts, my Texas Instruments, a little bit of my Johnson Johnson, and see if they are within the value range. If not, I will focus on tier two um and maybe spread it out over two or three but i honestly don't know it's 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 a hard question in, in a downtrend because you don't know how long the downtrend happens yeah. but what, what i can tell you is during covid when i was buying was a little bit more aggressive than i am now um and i was i was spreading it across three four and five different companies at a time so that's that's what i did John. Yeah, but he said he says about his fees so on this the only thing i can tell you um you probably have a strategy where you wrote down some notes for me it is like quality it's my tier one in these times if there are so many options for instance also you can look at Allianz high yield and everything but in these times go for quality just cho choose those ones that are really the highest quality I yeah. would always say that in these times and if, yeah, fees I mean when you have companies out there like interactive brokers and and the Gyro, I, I don't know if you have access to them but fees just don't really enter my mind anymore because this is so low they are trading to one two you could also do as an alternative yeah. yeah good the next question is from claudius and claudius is asking any thoughts about uh you know what we just mentioned with starbucks so i believe claudius i think we we um, mentioned that already right so um we're we're quite okay with this one we'll, we'll we will observe and alex was asking about our thoughts about the shell ceo transition we also answered that already but then we have also a new uh group member here his name is michael um Kaczmierczak, and he's asking effectively he would like to er learn a little bit more or hear us talking a little bit more about how he could uh, uh, you know earn some additional money with option trading because he hears us talking about it from time to time yeah and that and that's the fear of when when we talk about it because when when i read halfway through I, I can see i'm quite new to investing okay and that, and that we yeah. mentioned that we that we trade options i mean right now if you're quite new i would focus purely on getting to know a company's financials and your investing strategy straight out options is is not easy you, you'll hear me talking about options but you will also hear me talking about some of the shit companies that i still own such as 
uh, Wish is somewhat one of them, and Solo Electric, uh, some electric car company that is a bag of crap, right? So I, I'm left holding some company. So it's it's not easy to do options. It's a lot easier to chase yield or chase premiums and and get get burnt. I got an email actually from one of our listeners. Talked to him on and off. Uh, some bit. He's he's retired. He's financially free. He's given me some great advice over over the last couple of years, and I really like chatting to him. But he, he wrote to me. I wrote uh, an article, a first article in the world. I'm going to try to get back right. But I did write. I wanted to go through my strategy again and, and just really put it in writing out there so everybody can see. It, I can see it, and it's something to refer back to. But he questioned me on on my um my strategy with options and and. To be fair to me, said I don't. He doesn't understand it. Why not just invest that company in, invest that money that's sitting on the sidelines in in good solid dividend companies, and you'll probably earn the same amount in the long run. Um, he he has a point. To be fair, you you will. I mean, I I did write back and I said I've earned more in terms of cash dollars. I've earned more in options but then the truth behind that is that i took a lot of risk early on if, if you were to look at my option income now it, it is obviously lower but my risk is is gone lower as well so i, I think there is definitely it's, a, a point Derek, there. Yeah. it's really simple everyone's a hero and a successful person in the bull market and you've been doing yeah. option trading mostly in the bull market in exactly. the bull time yeah exactly so my my advice is when we're saying it certainly ignore me i've been caught a few times um I don't know if it's always the right thing to do, and I don't know if it will actually increase the rate of return, to be fair. Yeah, so Michal, same here. Stay away from it when you're new. Master the game first of normal, uh, long-term investing. Um, it is risky. Uh, for instance, I've got now three three uh, option trades that are underwater. Um, and now, you know, the interesting fact is like, you see it in the current share prices. For instance, I've got a uh, put option on Intel at 35, but I know it's trading at 31. And I'm thinking like, shit, I would love to buy that 31. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but now I, I won't buy because I know I will get them probably assigned at 35. So psychology, psychologically, this is still really hard. Yeah, and I'm okay with it because I really told myself I wanted at 35, so I'm going to get them if they get assigned, right, in October. But that, but I know that I'm 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 really patient compared to many other long term or not long term, but just many investors out there because I see it continuously on social media. So I'm already patient, really patient. I already have limited fear of missing out, and I'm still having these thoughts. Now, if you're a little bit uh, subjective to impulses and such, definitely stay away. Definitely stay away because you you will burn your hands really hard on options. You 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 will you will you'll definitely come across companies like I did, such as Wish, and think, okay, they've had a decent quarter, they're going to grow, this blah, blah, blah. You're justified in your head, even though you know you're wrong, you will make a justification yeah. to chase that and, and you will get caught. But definitely, I think the best thing to do starting out is to ignore options, ignore social media when it comes, everybody talks about what they're earning and, and so on, but just try and ignore it. Focus on the fundamentals, get a good solid base behind you. And then once you understand and you have uh, maybe a decent network behind you, then you can maybe try and expand your your portfolio in different ways. But I would just focus on, on for me, dividend growth investing right now. Yeah. However, he did ask what he could read. And I know that you did, together with uh, Phil Seckler, you did an episode on the wheel strategy. Yeah. And um, which episode was it again? Somewhere in the 60s, right? Yeah, it was a long so, time ago now. Yeah, exactly. So what I would suggest, Michal, look a little bit through uh, our Dividend Talk podcast. Uh, it is somewhere in there. There's an uh, there's an episode about the wheel strategy where EMF and, and our friend Phil are discussing this. It was at a time that I was out one time. And um, at least they go through the fundamentals of that strategy. But I don't recommend that uh, if you don't have enough skin, not skin in the game, but uh, experience with, with, with investing it in itself. Good. Yep. Yeah, uh, Martin is, is next, and he is using, like so many others, I would imagine, your four tier portfolio setup. Um, however, he finds the size of the total portfolio too large, especially the tier four positions, as they have little impact. Um, it takes so much time to follow a lot of companies, which which we know. 
how much time do you guys spend following your lower tier companies? Not a lot. Uh, that's why they are lower tier. <laughs> uh, so my my kind of my time is also equally distributed. I would say, you, you know, Matt, that that's the, I don't need to actually follow all the companies on a quarterly basis. I mean, we, we do some because of our podcast that it automatically comes. But there are companies that I don't check every quarter. There's even probably some companies I don't even check every year. I just see them in my portfolio. I see them always increasing dividends. So, but it is true that 40 stocks, yeah, there's a lot. It needs to be your hobby, right? Uh, it's simple as that. I think also that 40 is a large portfolio. Um, but you know what I also noticed is that many investors that start, dividend investors, they end up easily with 60 or 70 uh stocks over time because they're there every time other stocks are popping up and they're just adding them and adding them and adding them and most of them also can't follow it so it, it is really here i think might uh, like you can do tier four you can do it tier three i think the, the the amount of tiers are not so relevant it's for me just a system that i've set up where i say like okay these are really the stocks so shell microsoft for instance my, my uh, i hold i always check them because those are my biggest positions there's also the biggest risk of capital loss for me for instance or the biggest risk on a dividend cut uh, impacting my income but there are these i mean yeah there are several stocks that are so low in my portfolio that i really don't actually often look at them so yeah, I don't know how, if if you have a similar approach, uh, similar thinking there. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, look, it's it's quite hard to to juggle lots and lots of companies. You you will always have a favorite, couple of favorites that you will always check. Yeah, exactly. Always. Um, but other than that, just maybe scan the news every now and again. If you don't hear anything about the company, it's it's usually a good sign. You can forget about them. Oh. And then when the reports come out, just look at the headline numbers: revenue, yeah. earnings, cash flow, and debt, and and just see. Are they within your acceptable range? If they're okay, there's no real bad news coming about the company. You don't have to. You don't have to yeah. go and sit and read 133 pages of the annual report every time. I'm, I'm not checking my portfolio, and I see Chubb here, the insurance company. We might have touched it on a dividend talk uh, show one time, but honestly, I can't. I, I have no clue about their current financials. The only thing I know is that they were doing well. Yeah, as an example. <laughs> But that's all, that's all you need to know, and that that's probably one of the good things about dividend growth investing. You don't have to stay on top of, of these guys. If you have a Tesla, if you have uh, a mm, less yeah. a less mature company, you have to stay a little bit more on top of these guys because it changes so fast. But I mean, we're we're investing in large cap companies, been around for decades, that chug along. Um, so yeah. all all you're really doing is making sure that there's not negative in the news, like like Intel, for example. We know. There's lots, lots of negativity around Intel. Yeah. So uh, you keep an eye on Intel a little bit more, but I'm not hearing anything about Texas Instruments. So I know I don't have to watch Texas Instruments and all that. So it's, yeah. it's, that's how I would look at it. Good. That's actually a really nice bridge because the last question is from Sly Badger and he's asking whether Intel will cut the dividend and what will you do if it happens? Sell at more? I don't have any, so I can't sell them. <laughs> <laughs> um, will they cut the dividend? That's that's a good question. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I really think Intel are in uh, a suitable place where they can capitalize on. Or like we know, we know this space has a lot of potential. It's a tough time at the moment. Um, we know there was lots of news with Nvidia as well in in terms of the chips, um, but. I think they can turn it around if they can if they can hold out two or maybe one or two years, then we, we we will see. But will they cut the dividend? They, they do generate a lot of cash flow. To be fair, they do generate a lot of cash flow. Their dividend, the last time I remembered, was quite safe. So I don't see them cutting it too soon. Yeah, I have the same. I don't. I don't think they have a reason to cut. Yeah, but I do know that there is a lot of pressure also from some more how you said um bigger investors to to focus more on other areas than the dividend and, and free up cash but they've been confirming all the time that they're good with the dividends so and they have a really strong balance sheet let's not forget that right um they will have one or two years of negative cash flow probably 
they might need to leverage up, but the leveraging up from a really strong balance sheet is really, really not an issue. Specifically, not if they kind of make around their prediction uh, there. So, I find that uh, and cut really likely from uh, unlikely from a financial point of view. But you never know what kind of pressure there is in the boardroom from I don't know hedge funds and such. So that's why it's hard to predict. If they would do it, would, would I sell? It is really difficult for me to say because I see it more as a turnaround play. So, you know, if they need to cut the dividend to free up some cash, but really allocate it in a good investment, then yeah, I might actually keep it. Um, I do hope, I do hope that it uh, will not do it because after the turnaround, I'm really aiming for it to be one of my core dividend growers. Yeah, but um, it's hard to say. Shell, I didn't sell. This day we sold straight away. I really need to look at it at the at that moment in time, but it would really, really it it will be a decision point for me. If it if it happens, I need to do my homework that day, and and see AT and T. I cut straight away, uh, but AT and T was really shit stock for me already. I got a little. I I still don't know why I actually bought it necessarily. So, yeah, cool. Um, it's look time will tell, but as as we said, Intel is a turn round play. My turn round. It might go. It might go to zero. Who knows? But it's. Um, I think it's too early. I think the current environment is not a good time to judge them either. I don't no. think. I don't think. Not true. Cool. So that's that's the end of the show. Thanks. Thanks a million to all the guys for the questions. We do like the questions. They they keep us on our toes. I, I generally don't read half of them until we're actually in the show. So it's always quite quite a surprise when we get them. But uh, thanks a million. Keep keep them all coming, and we will. See you all next week.